Hello and welcome to another live video. I've been trying to kind of get back in the game. I was doing these for ages and then basically a few months went past. I was traveling, stopped doing them, and then I just, you know, felt a little bit nervous. Yeah. So now I'm back in the game and I've got a good friend, Kent Dobson, who is visiting from Grand Rapids and uh, he's in LA for a few days. Yeah. Uh, he did a small podcast. Um, two days ago. Yeah. You may have heard of Rob Bell, but, um, you know, he was kind of practicing for, the for real his, deal for the real deal. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we do a Pete Rollins Facebook live. Yeah. So, um, um, hello. Hey, how's it going? Can I ask you, first of all, were you born in America or yeah. in Northern Ireland? No, no, no. Uh, yeah. Sorry. My dad was born in Northern Ireland in Belfast. So yeah, he immigrated when he was 14. So that whole side of my family is all Northern Ireland. So. Yeah. But you've gone back a few times. I you've have. gone there. You've I've been a out. bunch. Yeah. I started going when I was two and then we went every few years. Not that I remember when I was two. But. Yeah. And actually Kent's dad um, was a very you know, significant figure in the religious landscape of America. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Do you want to tell? Because I, I don't know if people will know that. No, probably that. not. Um, how can I describe my family? Um, well, first of all, my grandpa was an itinerant Methodist minister. He would ride around on a motorcycle. I just found this out recently. Oh, like, wow. Around Northern Ireland, which is already like this mega religious place anyway. So it's just, I can't, I can't imagine what that was like, but just going around, I guess, giving sermons, whatnot. So then he moved to America, I guess, to convert Americans. And my dad followed in his path becoming a minister. And then um, bef just before I was born, my dad started working for Jerry Falwell. So he went from Northern Irish accent preacher man, suddenly into religious right, dreaming up the moral majority, politics and religion, and Jerry Falwell's universe that he created in the 1980s. So that was, my dad was part of the architect of that and, uh, and participant at the same time. Um, yeah, so that's the world I grew up in, yeah. you know, religion, politics, you know, Republicans, that's all uh, going to church five times a week. There was not another world that I was exposed to when I was a kid, you know, just that. And that was interesting. Uh, Kent was just taking a picture of a picture I have on the wall. Let me show you this. Um, so it's a picture of a Time magazine, and uh, the year was... 66. 66, yeah. Yeah. So this was a point when kind of radical theology, some of the work that I'm interested in was kind of at its height. Like this was a time where really critical thinking about religion was happening. This went through the 60s into the 70s, but then something fundamentally shifted. And then as we enter the 80s, the religious right exploded. And this whole movement basically died a death. That's when your father kind of was, was it the 80s or when, like when he connected? Definitely the 80s. Right? This, yeah, this 70s, was, 80s, yeah. This is what crushed <laughs> what was going on at this period of time. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. It, are you saying that it crushed the whole theological momentum that Tillich and others had really ushered? I think so. Yeah, in, yeah. Have you looked at that at all? Have you I mean, that? I'm not much of a historian of that time period, but that makes sense, mm -hmm. especially on the popular level. Mm -hmm. um, and I think even, I'm guessing, but kind of progressive thinking inside the Anglican slash Episcopal Church, um, which is where I locate some of that stuff, I guess, um, Tillich and Ro Robinson and, and these others, you know, all of a sudden they were overshadowed by this Baptist slash evangelical thing that just became, for a while it seemed like that's what Christianity is. Yes. And that's what it is in America. And we have to redeem and rescue America from these liberal people. Yeah. And, and that was a big part of my dad's work and Falwell too. It wasn't just rescue people from secular godless America, but from liberal Christian yeah. America and the footing that it had maybe gained in the 1960s and 70s. And probably also, when, when was the Second Vatican Council? Oh, yeah. Was that in the six, 70s? No. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. But it's yeah. somewhere around it, that time yeah, period. Yeah, it was a rejection of that. Definitely. Big-time rejection of that, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
and, and to give these people credit, um, and like one of my best friends, my best friend, Jay Baker, I mean, his dad, Jim Baker, was part of this movement as well. But these were people who had charisma mm -hmm. and they had, they, I mean, they, you know, they, they had a certain set of skills. They had, they were able to strategize. Raise um, money. Raise strategize. Money, strategize like, yeah. So they, they had certain skill sets, which the, um, the radical theologians didn't have. That's right. Jerry Falwell was an incredible human being. I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up in his house, you know, I mean, in and out of his house and he had like a photographic memory. If he met you one time, he would remember your name and your birthday and what you do and where you live and, and who your parents are, everyone. And he treated everyone that way. So he would be talking to Ronald Reagan one day and then just see, you know, some schmuck on campus, Sarah and Tim and be like, Hey, you know, you're from Ohio. How are your parents doing? You know, I mean, just that kind of charisma. Mix that with a little power, and you've got you've got some mega influence, I think. Wow. So yeah, it was a strange, but I didn't know any different. You know? Yeah. It's not, it's not like I, I was between worlds. No, that's the only world I knew. Yeah. But then your father, he made a, he made a, a big leap. Yeah. I mean, over the course of of his time, he mm. he made a step out of that. Is that yeah. Right? Yeah. My dad passed away like a year and a half ago, and it's even like dawning on me now how brave some of what he did was um and that is leave the grip of Falwell who's like you know imagine a a, a leader who would demands loyalty I know no one can imagine that in today's yeah. political climate but that's what Falwell's like and my dad walked out on that and I think in his mind it was I want to get back to church without politics, helping ordinary people, you know, with addiction problems and struggles in their marriage and, you know, normal life. He just wanted to, I think he wanted to get back to being, in his mind, just like a regular pastor. And that, that took some courage. And then he, I think over time, started taking some risks. I would not call him, he wasn't a liberal, but he took some progressive risks, I think, as an evangelical um, in the early 90s, late 80s, um, he started supporting AIDS uh, people in our town. And that was like kind of extremely radical, I guess, at the time. Yeah, so he, in his own way, he was on his way out of a certain kind of narrow yeah. view of Christianity um, and, and took whatever risks he was capable of taking, I think, in the time that he he lived so so yeah. whenever whenever you got to the point of critical thinking yeah. and critical awareness of these issues where were you had you you'd already taken that step where you were i don't know um let's see how would i describe that um i don't know i mean in high school i just didn't like church life you know typical rebellious teenager but I went to Falwell's University. Oh, so, yeah, I, I went there. I was an English major. I played soccer there, played soccer there, meaning I sat on the bench most of the time. But um, So I was back in that environment and just like didn't feel at home there, but was just learning, I think, to maybe think more critically about it. It's one thing just to say, like, I'm going to do drugs and ski. That's like, like kind of a rebellion. It's quite another thing to say what's really going on and uh, what wh what is my I guess identifying trying to identify what is my worldview what do I think about these things. And by the way, whenever people rebel, like I'm going to go out, get drunk, take drugs, sleep around, you know, nine times out of ten, then they go back. It's like backsliding. Definitely, like the, the real radical move is starting to deconstruct yeah. starting to not not rebel against because what you do is you, you bounce like a ping pong ball yeah. from one side to the other but to question yeah i sometimes i think uh, rebels have a slight advantage in that they slip momentarily out of the system and it, maybe maybe their own shadow is the thing that pulls them out but then you're right they just kick right back in yeah. and then they're even more zealous and, the, and then their story oh, i used to be on heroin and now i'm back in the fold um but yeah i totally agree the real the real hard work is when the, all that stuff starts to unravel yeah. and you really feel homeless and it doesn't matter if you do drugs or not so that and that took a lot of time i think to 
and pressure. And some of that was just working, eventually working inside the church myself. Yeah. Doing that's, the thing I said I wouldn't do. Yeah, because that's it. You know, fast forward, right. you're you're working within a church. Uh, Kent, many, some of you will know, some of you won't. But um, as pastor of Mars Hill, um, after Rob Bell left, and so you're fast forward. You're in the church. Yeah, itself, I was in the church. The, yeah, so I was at the beginning of Mars Hill um, doing the music, and Rob was doing the teaching. And Rob worked for my dad, so that was the whole connection. He worked for my dad, and then. My dad encouraged Rob to, I mean, Rob, it was Rob's idea, but um, encouraged him to start a church, you know, and then this thing took off. Um, and so I, then I was in it. And the funny thing about having to work inside the church was that I didn't have anyone else to blame, especially yeah. like in these uh, evangelical churches where you can make up crap, you can make up your own doctrine statements if you want. There's nobody looking over your shoulder except the people that are already a part of it. Um, but I couldn't like blame anyone for the music. If it sucked, it was my fault, you know? <laughs> and uh, so then you're like in it. And, and then I think the, for me, they started as intellectual questions about the origins of Christianity. Who was Jesus? What is Judaism? That's, that cracked the door for me, which, you know, I mean, German theologians were are talking about a hundred years before, but yeah. they were new to me. Yeah. Um, what is the Bible? How did it come together? And so, yeah, I did that for like f the first four years in Mars Hill. And then I moved to Jerusalem to go to graduate school. Cause yeah, cause you took an interest in the historicity yeah. of the text. I mean, it, I mean, you've written a, a, a commentary on the Bible. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, you should you buy it. And I see first century study Bible before they stop printing it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's a good point before yeah. they stop printing it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And that was at that, that 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 rep the the NIV first century study Bible represented a represents a certain time period in my life and passion, which was contextual stuff, you know, mm -hmm. language, context, Jewish studies, rabbi so and so, and even a little bit of the early church fathers. And that was like fun, I think, fun, exciting, but also dismantling. I mean, anyone who is honest, as you know, that wades into these waters of language and and um, how things were formed historically, like doctrines and um, church structures, you just realize right away, this is a convoluted mess. And there's no such thing as orthodoxy. And um, there's no such thing as the text means, um, at least in a, in a straight ahead way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even if you know the original language. So I don't know, it, it was like a, it, it was a time period where I was coming alive sort of intellectually and spiritually, but also things were also unraveling and the, the, it didn't work anymore. Um, my certain tenets that I was handed about the Bible, about what does it mean to be a human being just stopped working Yeah, uh, in the middle of that. And then I, then I eventually took Rob's job after, after graduate school and after I was teaching high school for a while. So that's like my, short bio yeah 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 so you find yourself within you know a very significant church uh you know an internationally significant church um uh but in this process of the messiness of religion and the messiness of of, of the biblical text mm -hmm. uh you know how did that how did that feel how did that pan out i mean um was that a place that you were able to explore some of those things I know he left eventually, but I mean, I, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of some of the positivity of it. Yeah, I mean, in the positivity of it, uh, Mars Hill for a while was a place where questions were welcome. And that was a different than the world I grew up in. And that was, I, I was trying to encourage this, such a thing. The problem is when you encourage that, that's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And people are like, okay, yeah, then, I, then I'm going to question all this stuff. Um, so that was, that was felt life-giving. Um, and even Rob, I think, left a wake of curiosity. And he's a curious person. And I think he was in one, on one level saying, be curious about your own experience. Be curious about faith. Be curious about Jesus if you want. And don't be afraid to question things. So that, was, that felt really life-giving. And, and I, I don't know. I just I continued um, down the path. It's like um, at the very – I have a new book. And um, at the beginning of it, I have a, what I say, I just put a note to heresy hunters. This is what I have in like my introduction. 
And I basically say, all right, if just to be upfront about it, I am already a heretic. I have no problem with that. But I mean that also in the traditional sense to hold an opinion. I'm trying to hold some opinions. I'm trying. That's what a heretic is. Um, and I think Jesus was a heretic in my personal opinion. So, and the other thing I say is that if, if people are concerned that I'm on the slippery slope, I am. I'm, I'm actually already at the very bottom. And it's, it, for me, it was not a one-time walk out. It was just a slow kind of tumbling. And what was that like? It was exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. And I guess over time I came to trust that that's what growing up looks like. It's terrifying. If it's real, it's terrifying and exhilarating, I think, at the same time. And, um, yeah, and once you start hinting that you have left the village or you're about to leave the village, then the village absolutely, you know, freaks out. Yeah. And I think even the village in your own head, like, yeah. meaning all the voices that say, don't go any further, otherwise you're going to ruin your life. Um, I remember my therapist, I was like, I'm afraid I'm going to ruin my life. And yeah. he's like, yeah, I'm here to make sure that happens, yeah. you know? I've quoted that line. Yeah, I'm going to be totally it's that. I've quoted that in talks where someone's like, I'm afraid that it's, this is going to just destroy me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. That's good. But yeah, I'm interested in this because you are somebody who I really feel has done this journey without necessarily kind of like being destroyed in the process. So what tools did you use? I mean, you mentioned therapy there, but what, what tools helped you take this journey without, you know, in a sense, feeling like everything was falling apart? Maybe you did feel suicidal. No, I did Maybe feel that. Did. Now, I don't think there's another way around it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't end so up in either. jail, <laughs> Yes, I suppose, but at least I haven't yet. Yeah. Um, but no, but there was a sense where not all of the ordinary categories don't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. And even in terms of a question like, who am I? Well, um, all of the categories like I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, I'm a scholar, I'm a husband, I'm a, you know, just start filling in the blank. Those stopped making sense. And that is what I mean by your life falling apart. That is your life. That's the only thing your egoic persona. And, I, and I'm, not, I, I'm not against the ego. Ego, you can't get by without an ego. But that's the only thing it knows, you know. And as soon as the pressure of life crises and existential pressure um, start doing their work, um, it does, at least it felt like for me, yeah, no, I, I have no idea where this is going to end. Um, so what, yeah, so what helped you through that? Because by the way, I'll say this about Kent. He looks the most together person I ever know. And so if he's in existential crisis, you'll never know because he's like a duck. He looks completely calm on the surface, but his feet are maybe flapping like crazy. <laughs> but whenever your feet were flapping like crazy, uh, yeah. what was going on? Like what, what tools did you use? I had that experience today, by the way, because I was out surfing and I'm not that great of a surfer. I'm just like learning. I mean, I can get up on the waves and go along, but I realized I'm out there sitting on my board and everyone is calm and my feet were doing that exact same thing while I'm sitting on my board because I'm trying to like stay upright, you know, yeah. but on the surface, I just appeared like everybody else. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, um, what would I say? Um, what helped me? Well, I mean, a couple of very serious, very uh, direct things helped me. I had a spiritual director. I actually had two of them. If you don't know anything about spiritual direction, um, I, I think it's one of the most uh, overlooked resources, psycho-spiritual resources. So a spiritual director, mine came out of the Dominican tradition is someone who mirrors back to you your own life. That's all a spiritual director is. And when you don't have eyes to see, they're not a director like, and you should do this and you should read your Bible or something mm -hmm. like that. All they are is a good mirror. And a, and a good spiritual director also has some um, psychological tools probably in their belt, but they're not a therapist like, all right, we're gonna try this you know, breathing technique or something. They're just a very good mirror. And they also believe fiercely in being a human being. Like they believe fiercely in the goodness of being a human being and they trust that. And I needed that big time when I was saying things like, I'm a, I don't know who I am anymore. I'm, you know, 
I've gone off the rails. I, I feel like my life is ruined. My spiritual director was like, hey, you know, that's normal. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. I, you should be encouraged that you're on this path. How lucky, because that's what transformation looks like. And so I had a spiritual director, I had a therapist who was also a, kind of a combination. He was trained also as a spiritual director. And then I also, I entered um, a program with a guy named Bill Plotkin. And um, this is a nature based, I wouldn't call it ecotherapy. He wouldn't, but if you had to pick a category, it would be in that. So going out into the wild, turning up the heat on your existential crises rather than turning it down. Mm -hmm. Dream work. Um, I did a vision fast. Uh, all kinds of things. To, instead of trying to turn away from um, things that weren't making sense, I wanted to turn toward them. Mm -hmm. And this, this I would put maybe in the realm of soul work. Um, so, like, if you take Saint Francis's prayer, who, um, who are you to God? Who are you, and who am I? Those. If you take the thing about like spheres, who are you? God is kind of in the spiritual transcendent sort of realm. Who am I is in the, not that they're separated. I mean, it's a sphere, but who am I? That's the direction that I started walking, like the unconscious and what's beneath the surface of this persona that I've been carefully manicuring these years. Yeah. And trying to prop up. What happens if that thing stops making sense? Um, and then into the depths. So, but because I was in a program, it kind of held my feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. So I did a year long immersive program where I did four experiences in the wild. And I had kind of like a, um, a group of 11 or 12 people that I did that with. And my wife is also a spiritual director. So um, having a partner that was, not afraid of yeah. the kind of thing that I was going through really, really, really was a gift. Um, so that was a gift. Um, those are the things that helped. Yeah. Um, but I would say largely what was not helpful were people who were trying to stop the thing from happening. Like don't go down the slippery slope. Don't uh, just stay inside, stay inside, go on sabbatical just kind of take a rest and rejuvenate your spirit and come back to the church and everything will be okay. Um, no, I needed voices that were going to just like, give me the little bit of a shove. If I got stuck on the slope part way down, yeah. I had a few people that just like a gentle little keep going. That probably, I mean, that's brilliant. Cause that's probably where a lot of people feel is that they're on this, they're on this journey and there are a lot of voices that are saying, don't go that direction like that like that is a dangerous place to go but in your experience which is the psychological experience it's in a sense you had voices that said no actually we want to encourage you down that path yeah we want to yeah mm -hmm. i think two things happen i don't know if, if you connect with this as a kind of metaphor but i think to go on the journey of soul which is the journey of descent in my view this mm -hmm. the, the archetypal journey of descent discovering who you are to return and serve in some capacity. You have to be whole enough. I don't mean healed, but I mean access to enough wholeness to go in the first place. The problem is there so many of us are terrorized by our wounds that it's hard to go on that journey. But thankfully I had kind of a couple voices helping at the same time, which was, Hey, let's work on some wholeness. Let's not stay up all night drinking. Let's uh, get some sleep. Let's exercise. Yeah. That's like normal egoic healing or wholeness. And you need enough of that, I think, to really drop off the cliff. Otherwise, I think it is actually really dangerous. Then you're just in, these, in the existential fires and you don't have any yeah. resources that I think aid in just getting through ordinary life, like, hey, so, I, I might need a job during this or something like that, you know? So is this, I mean, coming around to the book, I'm getting, yeah. is this what the book, your <laughs> book is trying to do? I don't know if it is. I know, this was not a big setup for now. Oh, is yeah. it, is and it, now yeah. all of the answers are in the book. In the book. But I'm, so Kent has this written a book called Bitten by a Camel, but in light of all of this, I'm going like, I mean, is that the voice you want to be for people? 
Are you trying to help them? Okay, so there are two main metaphors in the book. And so if none of you buy it, you'll get the, this is the drive through version, but please buy it. Um, you can donate $5 to me for this, just to get this. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, the two main metaphors are, are, one, we should pay attention to the places that we're bitten. Meaning, in, this, in the book, I tell a story of climbing Mount Sinai only to be bitten by a camel. So, and this sums up a lot of my experience living in Jerusalem. I went over there to find a super special God in a special place, and instead I was really disappointed. I was bitten. So we have to pay attention to those places. The other metaphor I sort of mix in there is this metaphor where Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. So I say, yeah, that's actually, I think, what growing up is like. At first, we think faith, spirituality, growing up, whatever you want to call it, is about loading up the camel with the right stuff, the right beliefs, the right community, the right ideas about God. We're going to load that baby up, and it's going to take us for the long haul. I'm saying that's a fine place to start. I don't really know if you can get around that, but what I'm talking about is what happens when you unload it. This has got to come off, and I don't think it's a one-time thing, but this has got to come off, and this has got to come off, this belief has to go. The notion of beliefs itself have to go, whatever that means, even though that's kind of a belief. Um, but what happens when, when things come off the camel? So that's what the book is about. And some of the content is straight ahead, like this no longer worked for me. And the camel, it had to come off the back of the camel for me to go any further. Things like the afterlife and original sin as being some kind of problem to God or apocalyptic end times things that I was grew up uh, believing and thinking about. These were examples of things that had to go on the way mm -hmm. for the camel to be any lighter. Otherwise, I just I kept getting stuck. So what, what, to answer your question. Well, it sounds like that. I mean, it sounds like that is what you're, you're, you're a voice, hopefully, for people who want to, who are already on that journey, who already feel like they've been bitten by it, that they're already unloading. Yeah. To encourage them that that's okay. Yeah. To, yeah, to encourage them that's Unless okay. the last chapter is, do not do this. No, no. The last <laughs> chapter back. is, no, no. It's like, <laughs> no, yeah. no. Um, yeah. And, and the other thing I would say is that part of what I, I sort of discovered um, very, very slowly was that some kind of extra special spirituality where I'm like kind of floating kind of above the earth. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just going to kind of keep ascending is something that I lost my taste for. Mm -hmm. And I instead started turning toward the ordinary and the human and the everyday, whatever I mean by God, that's what I mean by God. And if God is even a helpful metaphor anymore, which is something I talk about in the book that also had to stop the word God stopped working for me. So I am trying to say that's not totally crazy. Yeah. Maybe that's what growing up looks like for certain people. I also think not everybody's there and, and that's okay. Um, but I'm not going to try to talk people out of that. I'd like to look for ways to turn up the, yeah. the heat, so to speak, yeah. which I mean, is what you're doing. You turn up the heat all the time. You, yeah. At least I think so. Well, I like at the moment I'm doing a book study, uh, one of my favorite theology books, Christ in the End of the Meeting. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing about the book, again, is it's, it's saying that, we're always looking for something that will fix it, fix things. And it might be something very crude, like having the right house, the right car, whatever. It might be something very ethereal, like having the right religion, having the right philosophy. But this whole structure of having to do something is potentially the problem. And that actually, the crazy thing is, it's not 10 steps to be a better person. That weirdly, the first step is to go like, I'm not doing any steps. Yeah. I'm going to accept the chaos that's happening. I'm going to look at the craziness. And that that's a, a much more radical move. And if you go to a self-help section of the bookshop, yeah. you will have a hundred books that will tell you in different ways how to get to where you are, to where you ought to be. Mm. So we all live between who we are and who we feel we ought to be. And so many books are trying to chart the course yeah. from one to the other. But the mm. radical move 
is to cross this whole thing out mm -hmm. and to go look at who you are yeah. and wrestle with what is. That's right. No, I totally connect with that. And I also have a kind of almost, um, I get, maybe it's a kind of faith that if you do that, you will descend to discover some kind of seed that of who you are that you almost know nothing about. Yes. And that it's, a, it's actually quite amazing. There's yes. a kind of gift in one's own unique humanness down there somewhere yes. that feels totally different than 10 steps to achieving my ideal, you know, yes. personhood or something like that. hundred percent. The seed, the, the, the gift is in somehow breaking that whole way of doing things and confronting oneself yeah. in oneself. Uh, which is kind of a, a crazy idea, but I think it's deeply psychoanalytic and yeah. deeply theological. Yeah. I mean, grace is in a sense the word for accept, accepting that you're accepted. Yeah. I mean, grace is this radical thing of like, don't, you don't have to change. There's no 10 steps, five steps, two steps. Yeah. You are who you are. Yeah. And another thing that's um, kind of like a first, became a first step for me. This happened maybe three or four years ago. I was in a program and I was introduced to dream work. And I would say of, of, I was the kind of person that I would say, I don't really remember my dreams. Like, you know, my wife remembered her dreams, but I was like, you know, whatever, maybe every once in a while, but I didn't really take them seriously. And um, so I, I went into this uh, workshop retreat, five day thing. And I just took their advice. First night, wrote down a piece of paper, dream one, right before I went to bed, I just woke up, had three dreams. And one of them turned out to really like turn my life upside down. And, and I don't mean like, this is not a workshop that was, that was like, and this is what your dream means. And we're going to interpret it. It wasn't actually about interpretation at all, but some, some trap door opened up and imagine if the seed of you down there that we're just, just describing metaphorically, um, imagine half of your life, meaning when you're asleep, it's trying to help you. Mm -hmm. It's it's creeping in and un and through imagery and emotional scenarios, trying to pry or push against that thing we call waking consciousness. Every single night, it's mm -hmm. like conspiring. Yeah. Um, that at least that's kind of my view of of how dreams sort of work on the conscious ego, um, which I just think is funny because um, it's almost like our soul. That's what I would call it. Is um, wants the best for us but when we wake up in the morning what do we do we open up the self-help book and say we're going to get back to work we're going to fix this baby and i'm going to get to my ideal self yeah and every time we go to sleep that ideal self gets ripped to shreds yes so I mean, that, yeah that's that's the, the the idea of dream work in the psychoanalytic tradition is that it is um it's almost like you're in prison and you're not allowed to say what you really think and you have to write these letters and you're writing letters, but you know the sensor's going to see them, and that's all right. Yeah. But it's the unconscious is like is is sneaking out. Yeah, the dream is sneaking out <laughs> stuff that your sensor, like who you, like you should love your family. You should be a believer who believes everything. You should the the the, the sensor who's telling you all these mm -hmm. things. The the dream is like trying to get things past the sensor. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And to come back to what you said before, that's just one aspect of our selves that's just trying to get us to turn our attention to what is yeah what is really the case yeah right now yeah my present reality not who i think i am but and turning toward that darkness and golden stuff all together yes it's a mixture of turning and that's the thing if you're not willing to turn toward the shadowy material you're also going to miss all the glittery material yeah. it's the same you know yes. I mean, I don't know if this analogy is going to work. Let's see if it works. But imagine you're in prison and you're writing a letter to somebody outside the prison and you're saying, everything's wonderful. The guards are great. You know, they, I get regular exercise. It's fantastic. And, they're all, and there's as much custard as I can eat, right? But the person who's receiving the letter knows that you're allergic to custard and you hate custard and it makes you throw up. What's happened there is you've got a message through the sensor that that's actually things aren't great. In the same way, our conscious life is often everything's wonderful, relationships good, jobs good, I'm I'm doing everything right, I'm gonna get that next promotion. 
but something in your life is sending out that is getting the, the truth out mm. that things are not as good as they look and the dream is almost like that and, and i get as much custard as i want <laughs> it's like the dream is <laughs> like so good it's just slipping something through yeah yeah that's so good so do, is that a good way of thinking about this book, A Bitten by a Camel? Is well, the, I mean, the, yeah, it's about shedding things from the camel. Um, and so some of it's a little bit theological, and I didn't really realize that until I was done writing it. And like people have said to me, wow, you really knocked out like five or six major theological tenets that you at one time held and sort of said, this stopped working for me. And a little bit of what kind of grew in its place. Um, it's not a book where... I used to think this and now it's all like kind of rosy and, and I've reinterpreted everything, but there is a little bit of uh, unraveling and just a little bit of like what I was saying about turning toward the ordinary, like, um, or turning toward um, the unknowing of God as a spiritual path instead of the absence of a spiritual path or something like that. So um, yes, yes. Um, By the way, I should, I, something I never did. I always test to make sure that people are listening and, and it isn't broken. Hey, but, I would so have I enjoyed it anyway. I know I would have enjoyed it anyway, but hopefully some people can hear this. And as I'm thinking, I'll have a look, see if anyone's got questions on the high tech iPhone that's that's here. Um, oh, somebody's saying, Miss, you can't. Somebody called Deb. I cannot pronounce their surname. Why do you have a surname that's so hard to pronounce? That looks Russian. Synopsis, synopsis, or whatever, but I guess they're a Grand Rapids person. They miss you. We've got people from there's Springfield, Missouri, there's Florida. Give um, us some questions. But has, yeah, has anybody have any questions? I'm aware that sometimes it takes a little minute for me to see them. So I'm not like censoring you if you think I haven't asked your question. But if you have any questions, please write them down on this. And, uh, at the moment, you're all just saying hello from different parts of the world. Let me see. What a magical thing. It is incredible. I am amazed by this technology. Uh, oh, here we go. Yes, now I see your questions. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so, so Chris is asking, you've heard of Ken Wilber's book, Religion of Tomorrow? Question mark. So much of this is in there. I don't know if you have. Have you read Ken Wilber? I I've read a really. lot of Ken Wilber, but not that one. Uh, I've read an, an essay that's kind of seems related to that. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, 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 here's how I feel with Ken Wilber. I think what he's saying is true. And I feel like I also reach my limitations when yeah. I read him. Like, I, I think I get what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a little, he's a little dense, but his sort of four quadrants that um, I think is the, f I think the future of, um, seeing what he calls holons in all things. So a, a much more whole view of what it means to be human, much more whole view of society, much more whole view. He's, he, he, to be honest, like he's operating in such a different paradigm than me yeah. that I haven't been very convinced, but I do think I need to delve in and read yeah. him and see. Cause yeah. he's uh, got a nice article. I'll send it to you. I sent it to Rob. He's got a nice article about um, what he thinks is going on with Trump. Okay. And it, it is worth reading. Yeah. And in a surprising way, I mean, you have to get into his memes. Um, he, he blames, I think, uh, so much of what's happening on progressive liberal well, so I. Oh, greenness. Yeah. I hardly talk about political stuff because yeah. I'm very out of key. But the, the, left, the kind of people like Slavoj Shizak and myself you know, think that in a sense, this is a, this is a symptom of the, the, the failure of the left. It's yeah. a failure. You know, so. Yeah. That, and there's not many people saying that's so what I have to read. Exactly. Yeah, it's worth reading. Uh, it's worth reading. Yeah. Now, lots of people are just making lots of connections. It's funny that people are going like, there's a guy, Josh, talking about the late Alan Watts. Um, and there's uh, somebody else mentioned, where was it? Um, Joseph Campbell, Susan. Well, Joseph Campbell has been very influential in my own sort of development, I think, just reading his stuff and the interviews with Bill Moyers I have, and I've watched them half a dozen times, but Joseph Campbell was able to identify something that other people were identifying, but not quite in the expansive way that he, that he did what he called the hero's journey, which I think probably is not a helpful metaphor to say anymore yeah, because yeah. the word hero, what I think he's saying is what we mean as the opposite of a hero. Cause yeah. our only understanding of hero is victory. 
-hmm. What he's saying is that you go out and are destroyed. Yeah. And that's the hero's journey. And in the wreckage, you discover some seeds of some new birth. So um, that's not Hollywood. Yeah. That's not, you yeah. know, we had a problem and it was really hard. And then in the end, we were victorious. No, he says, no, you go and are dismantled. I, I have been... I've been a little bit resistant to Joseph Campbell, but the deconstructionists bought me one of his books. Yeah, which very one? beautiful hardback book called, I think, A Thousand Faces. Yeah, Hero with a Thousand Faces. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I, the little bit I've read of Joseph Campbell, yeah. I wasn't convinced about, but I'm going to, because thanks to the deconstructionists. Yeah. I'm gonna, well, here's, here's something that has been helpful to me. And this is like a summary of Campbell's work. But he's, if you're traveling on a certain plane, this is um, what we would call ego consciousness. Or I'll turn this way, ego consciousness. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to get to a certain point where that, that actually works. What do I mean by that? I mean, I know who I am. I think I do. I know who I am. My social role makes sense to me and other people. So whatever, I'm a teacher, I'm a pastor, I'm a lawyer. I did it. I, I got through the survival dance, meaning... I, I recovered enough from my childhood wounds that I can make a living for myself. Maybe I've even got a family, whatever. And, and when people ask me who I am, I'm able to say, Hey, this is what I do. You know, that's so you're traveling along, but then certain things start happening. Like there's a life crisis or a, one day I'm standing at the, the window in my corner office and I feel this emptiness. And at first I think I need to go see a therapist, but it turns out the emptiness is about something else. And the therapist is not helping. So then you start the descent. And every single thing in our contemporary world screams, don't go. Don't go, don't go, don't go. But anyway, that's the descent. And the descent, um, even the church, of course the church, because they don't understand that G the Jesus journey either, saying don't go. because. So anyway, then you over the cliff you go. But down here at the bottom, the underworld is... I think we have some language for the descent because actually, you know, therapists and, you know, counselors and people like are admitting, all right, we have problems and we need to talk about them. But down at the bottom, what is this underworld journey? And that's a lot of what Joseph Campbell, the material that he deals with, which are all in the myths and the ancient stories um, and the ancient heroes, this underworld, shadowy, uh, mysterious realm where you discover that gifts and wounds are two sides of the same coin. There they are. And that is like a very scary place to be. And also kind of a precious place to be. And then the, it begins the ascent, which whatever it is I discovered about wounds and gifts down here, and the face I had before I was born, so to speak, or soul, if you want to call it that, how am I going to bring that forth in the world? I know it's not going to look like when I was trucking along as a lawyer or a pastor or whatever. Um, and it may not matter like the job description, but what am I going to bring back for the benefit of the entire community? That's the hero. In my view, that's yeah. the a summary of the hero's journey. So something of you unravels and is completely undone and dies. And then somewhere, maybe you even need a few guides along the way. You begin to discover this wounds and gifts business. You, you, you're in the labyrinth down there, but if there's not a return for the service of something beyond yourself, then it's not, then it's not a hero's journey. It's not like, Hey, I found myself. And now I'm like, but that, that is the bit that I, this is why I'm not Jungian, especially not Jungian, but to, I uh, more, I am more Jungian. You're more Jungian. <laughs> yeah. Like, and here, yeah. This would be an interesting yeah. discussion. We can't go into it. Yeah. I, you know, and I always kind of, I'm, there's a lot of Americans who like you. Um, but and I, I'm nice enough about it. I like the early Jung. But I do not like the early Jung before he grew up and became yeah, the yeah. yeah when he lost his way yeah when, like uh, the, so for me like when he grew up I mean, yeah. I'm like when he thought he was a prophet and got religious but uh, <laughs> yeah but anyway but there uh, yeah so that's my same problem with Goose Camel is in one sense I am concerned about the idea that there is an original either self or an original wholeness or an original harmony or something so this is my the fundamental problem with me with young or object relations psychoanalysis is that is that the the deep the descent is a part of the journey yes rather than if you take a lacanian perspective um, or a freudian perspective the descent is it that we are the descent there is no return there is mm. no 
the descent is the healing. Mm. That, so it's the return that is, I think, you know, where you part ways. Where I part ways. How interesting. That's another, we'd have to, we'd have to unpack that another yeah. time. But I still, I guess I have some faith or trust yes. that there is such a thing as a return. If you're young and you have that yeah. bullshit. Yeah. And, I, and there's still hope for you. I'm not saying you're completely lost. No, there's gosh. still hope for you. Once you start returning, <laughs> ah, then you'll be like, all right, <laughs> I see it now. Yeah. Okay, we're going to finish with one question because right. we've been on here for a while. But I, oh, I lost it. Um, someone deleted it. Someone deleted it. Yeah. It was something about how do you do this within a church context. But you know what? We've been know. here for ages and who, who knows? And there's lots of questions now. <laughs> My goodness. Um, <laughs> Oh, oh, here, I'll finish with this then. One comment and then go is that Jeff says, um, did you or do you find things slipping past the sensor the other way? Is there ever a time when you feel you've taken something off the camel only to find yourself living, thinking, reacting as if it's still there? So uh, I'll, I'll read that last bit. Is there ever a time when you feel you've, in quotes, taken something off the camel only to find yourself living or thinking or reacting as, as if absolutely. it's still there. Absolutely. And actually, the things that come off the camel aren't intellectual ideas. Sometimes they take that form. That's actually very perceptive because people can say, I'm over X. Yes, that's why I like to put it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, well, sure enough, they behave that way. They, they behave right back in their own old patterns. So, yeah, totally. I, I, I mean... I was like that in many respects when I was a pastor because I didn't believe A, B, C, and D, yet I was behaving in ways that that was unrecognizable. Or to make it more personal, you might, um, you might come to believe certain things about your parents, like for, for good or ill, Ill. You, you, you've run them through a certain grid and you understand your childhood in a certain way. And you might say, hey, my father or my mother treated me in X way, and that explains why I have this particular pattern. And you might even go to a workshop and have a burning ceremony and let that thing go. And sure enough, at the next Thanksgiving meal, you're right back in the old yes. pattern. Yes. So the question is, is there any way out of that? In my experience, there is, but it happens very, very slowly. And I, I mean, that maybe maybe you could answer this more more in in a way that would be more helpful than I can. But it's only as you come to I think live differently very slowly over time that you come to discover oh I'm no longer kind of living like in the same kind of patterns. And I don't know what the mechanisms for change are. I tend to say some of it is mystery working on you over time. Some of it is seeing your own stuff in a way that kind of scares you. Um, you stop playing the either victim or blame game, which is the beginning of a lot of what people call counseling. They find themselves the victim and then they can, they can blame for a while. That has to stop working. Um, so I'm kind of rambling a little bit because I just, am, I guess I'm recognizing, yeah, that's true. That's what happens yeah. to people. That's what happened to me. Um, that's what still happens to me. So that's why, I mean, by the way, that's my, why I believe in rituals, whether it's whatever it is, but is that we can intellectually think we've overcome something mm -hmm. that we haven't. And it's, it's art, it's music, it's comedy. It's, there's various um, forms of indirect communication that can help us at an existential level, let something go mm -hmm. that pure uh, argumentation yeah. or philosophy <clears throat> can't. So yeah, it's, it's that idea that actually, yeah, overcoming something intellectually doesn't mean that you have. Yeah, and I guess I would up. put nature-based work, nature-based practices, which is what more, more of what I'm into, yeah. in that same category. It's hard to call them rituals, but there's a ritualistic, yeah. there's a ritual component to it. But when you expose yourself to the natural world in certain ways, over time, you begin to have your, your soul or, or your unconscious begins to have a more active conversation and there's, there's a sense where you're sort of pulled out of those particular patterns or you find yourself in this larger web, which you end up, I think, living differently, I think kind of slowly over time. But um, I don't know. Well, listen, we have more Belfast gin to drink. Yeah. So we have to do a bit of a gin tasting now. So I just want to say, listen, man, I love this. I think what you're doing is amazing. Thanks. We can Me have, too. We can have an old debate about <laughs> Freud and Lacan, or no, Freud, sorry, Jung. Freud and Jung. Although, this, yeah, you know, I'm an English major. You're, 
philosopher, so I'm a, I'm a little bit out of, out, I'd be speaking out of turn, but let's try sometime. Let's try sometime. What I know of Freud, I'll bring to the table, especially around dream work. Yeah. Or I mean, not Freud, uh, Jung. Jung. I'll bring okay. that to the table. We can battle it out. Yeah, and that Jung stuff and dream work's good. But anyway, so we can, so, and I also actually, I'll do a Facebook Live, maybe one time about the difference between Jung and Freud and, and Lacan and object relations. That would be fun to do. <clears throat> All right. But like, the, uh, Ken, I love it. You should actually, you do these, these retreats. Yes. If you want to do, so, if you want to actually go and experience this stuff in person, you do this. Yes, yeah. I'll be rolling more of them out this whole year. I call them wilderness within. What are they? Very simple ret retreats, pretty small. It's a combination of a little bit of teaching, group work, and then sending people out into the land and, you know, coming back and talking a bit about it. I found them, I mean, I'm passionate about them because I found they work for me. So I want to kind of hand, pass yeah. them on. So, yeah. And if, and if you're on this journey and you just need a bit of a helping hand, like just a friendly voice who is giving you, uh, not only kind of from their own experience, but also intellectually helping you in that journey, then buy the book Bitten by a Camel. It's like, you know, 20 bucks, you know, a few coffees. And hopefully that will, will help you as well. Anyway, thank you so much. I will hit end to this. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And um, I'll check in with you very, very soon.